meeting has been held remotely and also in person and will be filmed and recorded for live and subsequent broadcast available through the Council's website. The Council is a data controller under the General Data Protection Regulations of the Data Protection Act 2018. We broadcast and record Council meetings to fulfil our public task obligation to enable members of the public to observe the democratic process. Data collection during the process will be retained in accordance with the Council's public policies are available through the Council's website. Members of the Council are reminded that they should follow the Council's established meeting protocols, including around the use of the chat facility, and that comments made at the chat facility are visible to all participants in the meeting, which may include members of the public who also receive invites to the meeting. So, um, we're to the papers now. Oh, no, we're going to uh, apologies. Okay. And apologies from Councillor Crow, that is Councillor Robertson substituting. And we will now move to a roll call. Can the following members please indicate if they're present at the meeting either in person or remotely? Councillor Curley. Present in the chamber. Councillor Robertson. Present in the chamber. Councillor McCabe. Present remotely. Councillor McCluskey. Present remotely. Councillor McCormick. Present remotely. Councillor Maguire. Present remotely. Robbie McKenzie. In, in the chamber. Councillor McBee. Uh, remotely. Councillor Nelson. In the chamber. Councillor Reynolds. Present remotely. And Councillor Wilson. Present in the chamber. Are there any declarations of interest? Now, move on to the meeting itself. Um, and paper number two, um, which is external audit, sorry, internal audit progress report. Um, there's a Thanks, Chair. So this report sets out internal audit activity since the last meeting of the committee in January. There were two audit reports finalised, including freedom of information arrangements and cyber security arrangements. In relation to freedom of information, the overall control environment opinion was satisfactory. There were six green issues identified, which, if implemented, would enhance the control environment. An action plan is in place to address all issues by the 30th of June. In relation to cyber security arrangements, the overall control environment opinion was satisfactory. There were two amber issues identified, firstly in relation to user awareness regarding cyber security, specifically around the e-learning module uh, that's available in relation to cyber security. However, the completion rate of this training by employees is low. However, there is another IT security module which discusses aspects of cyber security, which does partially mitigate the risk. Secondly, a number of external accreditation exercises are overdue. This is primarily as a result of the rollout of Office 365. These exercises have been delayed until after the rollout has been completed and the ICT can review the IT infrastructure at that point. There were four issues identified and an action plan is in place to address all issues by the 31st of October. The field work for the 22-23 audit plan is almost complete and as a result of completing the IDRIB, Audit plan resources have been reallocated to carry out work on corporate purchase cards which had not yet started and was potentially going to be deferred into next year's audit plan. In relation to the National Fraud Initiative, matches have been received for the relevant data sets that were submitted for the 22 exercise and the total number of matches received is 1,351 and that is a 43% reduction in matches from the 2020 exercise. Our understanding is that the algorithms have been refined after feedback from participating organisations in terms of results obtained from the earlier exercises. In relation to internal audit actions, there were no actions due for completion by the 31st of December, and this status report is attached at Appendix 2. Apologies, Chair, there's an error on page 4 of the Appendix document where an action for cyber security has been duplicated. The correct entry is at the top of page five of the appendix. Thanks, Chair. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you for that. Is there any questions from members? Question from Councillor Yeah, okay. Um, Councillor Robertson. 
Thanks. Chair, this, this is a question based on the, the, the point you just said about the learning module not being sort of picked up as much. Um, it, it's a question born from my experience, and I'm just wondering if it's the same experience as our staff. Bear with me. Um, when we've moved on to using Chrome um, as the kind of Outlook browser, I don't, I'm not confronted with icon, it doesn't immediately go to icon when I switch on my browser. Whereas previously when I, I clicked on the browser, it immediately showed the icon, which meant that I was confronted every day with the news of the council, the prompts for e-learning, etc. And that's my experience as an elected member, which is probably less important than our, our, our staff's experience, but I don't know if it's, it's similar and if that's a uh, a factor in terms of us not being confronted with what e learning is available to us on a, an immediate and daily basis. Good point. Okay, through you, Chair, I don't have an answer on, on that, but I can certainly um, understand that as far as I'm aware, we're looking to um, review oh, the, right. the intranets because um, there, there are changes uh, required, and it's, I think we're going to link it into the outfacing website to make it easier for employees and anyone um, like you know like of your, yourself um, councillor Robertson to come in through the website and be able to see the intranet so to speak so um, I can certainly raise that with the, the head of organisational development um, because he's leading on that piece of work so that's no problem at all. Okay George do you want to come in? Yeah, so just to highlight uh, exactly what Andy was uh, Andy was saying there uh, at the last policy and resources committee meeting, uh, the communications and engagement strategy uh, was agreed, and amongst the actions, uh, it was uh, uh, two things: uh, the review of uh, Icon, um, and and this is exactly what uh, Councillor Robertson is experiencing: uh, is that the uh, it's it's so out of date that it won't show up on uh, uh, on Google Chrome. Uh, uh, or any other uh, search devices, uh, it's no longer uh, uh, supported by the uh, the provider, um, and uh, so uh, we're we're working through uh, uh, as that action is the the close down uh, of that, and and this is this is I suppose one of the symptoms of that. And Andy's right is is effectively migrating as much of our content that we can uh, online. It won't be right for everything. Um, so if there's any. Uh, uh, private content. We need to look for another location or a private space on the website. And a separate piece of work over the next year uh, is building a business case uh, for a, uh, a new website, uh, again, to make that slightly future-proofed and uh, fit for purpose, uh, uh, taking into account the, the new demands that we've got as an organisation. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor McCluskey, would you like to come in now? Thanks. Um, thanks, convener. Uh, just two questions. Firstly, on um, 2.6 in relation to the um, internal audit of freedom of information arrangements. I was just wondering if Andy could give a little bit more detail as to what the the set green issues were that were um, that were uh, found. And the second question is just on um, the compliance. For PSN, um, I see in later in the paper that the uh, the actions are to be completed by the end of May. But is there any risk to us at the moment of of not having that compliance? Are they, you know, are, are, are we likely to ever to lose access to any of these systems, or is that something that would come much later with a much longer length of non-compliance? Thanks. Yes, Thanks, Chair. So, in relation to the, the green issues that were identified, these were mainly uh, procedural improvements, um, management information improvements, and training and development within the, the wider um, legal and democratic services team to support um, what we understood to be a single person dependency, it was to make sure there was sufficient cross skilling to ensure that the roles and responsibilities to coordinate the freedom of information uh, process um, was was uh, robust. Um, so those those are the main types of issues that, that came through there. In relation to your um, your your second query in relation to PSN, 
Um, there is a, a framework where there is a, a failure in terms of PSM, there would be a remedial um, action plan that councils would have to work through. And indeed, that's what happened when PSM first came in, was first introduced. Um, and Rockleide was incredibly lucky we got through the first the first um, assessment period and we continued um, to, to be successful in re-accreditation. There's other councils um, who weren't able to be successful at the first, uh, first term and had to develop improvement actions and then resubmit their PSA accreditation. So I wouldn't expect there to be any immediate um, concerns, but I can uh, find that and clarify that from um, Alan McDonald, um, if, if that would be helpful, Councillor McCluskey. Yes, that would be great. Thank you. Alan, would you like to? Yeah, um, I can confirm I've discussed this action um, with, with Alan, um, and Alan is confident that the checks and balances we've got in place, obviously, this is about accreditation, not not looking after the security of, of, of um, IT information. So Alan's confident that the checks and balances we've got in place, and that will be uh, backed up when we do get the accreditation in, in May, and Alan's confident we'll hit that time scale as well. Okay, is there any other questions from members on that paper? Yes, on the Yep, thanks, Chair. Uh, Andy, on 2.10 regarding staff training, I see we've got an additional just over 1,200 employees still to do one of the mandatory uh, courses with a completion date for the 30th of June. Is that realistic? Do you cheer? So this has been communicated as, a, as an action plan and it's now sitting on the mandatory um, training and it's over to, to services and service managers um, to promote the, the requirements for the mandatory training. They do, uh, the majority of staff have completed the IT security um, training because you need to get, you need to undertake that training in order to gain access to the council's network. And the likelihood is that the cyber security module will also become mandatory before you are given access to the, the council's um, information security, um, like IT equipment, and also access to the network. So over time, um, that the, I think the officers are confident that 30th of June will be achievable, but I can certainly raise that through updates at uh, CMT just to make sure we're, we're confident with that date. Thanks, Councillor. Yeah, th thanks, Andy. I'd appreciate that. Thanks. Okay. Move on to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is our idea? Is that it? Yep. Okay. We're on to. Okay, someone must be external audit action plans. Actions. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chair. So uh, this report just presents the external audit action plans that are being proposed by officers. There's no change to the report since it came to the, the January Audit Committee, and there are four current actions being proposed by officers, which are set out at Appendix 1. Happy to answer any questions, and obviously Alan's here, and, uh, along with Matt, if there's any more uh, sort of technical detail that's required, I would defer to my colleagues. Thank you. Any questions from the members? Is everyone happy with the recommendation there? I agree. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Move on to item number four, and there has been another paper, um, an updated paper, I should call it. Um, the review of internal audit charter. Okay. So thanks, Chair. So the purpose of this report is to advise the committee that a review of the internal audit charter has been undertaken and there were no significant changes identified. The charter is based on recognised best practice identified by the Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors and also sets out the requirement for a quality assurance and improvement programme. In replies, we carry out an annual self-assessment against the standards, but we also participate in a peer review programme through the Scottish Local Authority Chief Internal Auditors Group regarding the validated self-assessment process. This was due to be completed during 2019-20. However, as a result of COVID, this has been delayed 
along with a number of other council external assessment processes. So this has been released at the Scottish Local Authority Chief Internal Auditor Group recently, uh, September last year, and a revised programme has been put in place to ensure all outstanding external peer assessments are completed as soon as possible. There's a further meeting of um, the Chief Internal Auditors Group later um, in March, and we'll get a detailed timetable at that point, so I should be able to give an update to the April Audit Committee on the timing of the external validated self-assessment. Chair, the report is asking for members to approve the audit charter. Thank you. Any questions, members? Happy to approve. Happy. Yeah. Okay. Move on to item number five, and we're playing council. Criminal Finances Act 2017 policy. Thank you, Convener. This report proposes the introduction of a policy for the Council in relation to the Criminal Finances Act 2017. What this Act did was create a specific offence whereby a corporate body such as the Council were to fail to prevent any of its employees or associated persons from facilitating tax evasion. So were any employee or associated person of the council to be found guilty of a tax evasion facilitation offence, then it'd be a defence for the council to prove that it had in place appropriate prevention procedures to prevent something like that from happening. So this policy is proposed in order to facilitate the council's duties in terms of the Act and the council's compliance of its duties. Um, and also to support the council and have in, in place appropriate prevention procedures and to provide some support and guidance to officers of the council. And a copy of the proposed policy is attached to Appendix 1 for the members' information. If anyone has any questions. appears to be on mute convener. Emma, no, no, Emma. That's great to me. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Did you hear about Councillor Wilson what his question was there? No, I didn't. Right. Sorry. Right, I'll we'll go again. Hold on, Emma. Um I noticed that the, the act was implemented in twenty seventeen. Uh, my question was, why are we doing it now in 23? Did you hear that? Did you answer that? Thanks. Yes. Yeah, there's no requirement for the council to have in place such policy, but the council is required, you know, has duties in terms of the act. So this policy would assist the council in complying with its duties. Well, yeah, why would you want to come in? Well, just a supplementary, please, Emma. Why are we doing it if we don't need to do it? Could, could uh, maybe Ian Strachan could come in mm -hmm. on this? Ian? Yeah, thank you. Through you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, as, as Emma helpfully said, you know, it, it could be said we don't need to have it, but from an officer's perspective, we believe it is a good thing to do. And also in terms of showing uh, civic leadership around such matters, uh, and we also believe that having in place a policy and importantly following it through operationally would help to mitigate the risks to the organisation should a staff member or associate be found guilty of such an offence. Um, I can't, you know, I just, I'm not aware of, um, you know, many authorities taking it for taking it forward before now, probably given other priorities, which may explain why it's only coming forward now. But um, we think it's a good thing to do and something that the authorities should be doing if that assists. Yes, yeah, thank you, Ian. Can I ask, are we councillors considered as a member of staff for this, uh, this piece of bureaucracy? Well, um, not specifically, or through, through you, Chair, not specifically councillor. Um, if you look at the terminology used in the Act, which is what we've replicated 
in the draft policy. Uh, I would also say that given the nature of uh, councillors' roles uh, really being more in terms of strategic direction, policy direction of the authority than operational matters, I would not expect so. However, I wouldn't want to say categorically that that is the case, but as I say, I wouldn't expect so from a personal perspective. Mm, I, I, to me, it's certainly unnecessary, but uh, I'll hold my wish. So, so if, if an employee uh, is guilty of one of those things, what action would, would the council be allowed to take? Um, well, potentially, the, I believe that the, you know the, the council itself could, as a corporate body, be guilty of an offence. Um, but you know, if say a staff member was found to have done something in that way, then almost certainly they would be themselves subject to disciplinary action or the potential of disciplinary action and potentially other forms of sanctions in a personal capacity. But this is looking at the council as the corporate body. And I suppose the intention behind the legislation is that corporate bodies are seeking to do what they can to avoid uh, such tax evasion taking place. Yeah. Yeah. Going to speak on this. Thank you. Um, I can uh, hopefully there's some clarity that the point brought to me by um, another council in Scotland who did a round robin of directors of finance to see if anybody had done anything about this. And that flagged it up to me that this is something that we should be um, taking forward. This is uh, about the council, A, protecting itself by making sure that our officers are aware of the liabilities that they have and that the council will have if we facilitate tax evasion. And that's why it's coming in front of the audit committee uh, today. So I, I don't want members to think this is, you know, this is, this is um, needless bureaucracy. This is about staff being trained. And we've talked about cyber security. This is about staff being trained to protect the council and to protect themselves in, in, and be aware of their roles and responsibilities. And if the council were at an officer level to facilitate tax evasion, then there are very severe fines that could be imposed. If the council didn't have checks and balances in place, didn't have a policy, hadn't undergone training uh, for the relevant staff, and all these things will now flow subject to the audit committee approving the policy prepared by Ian and Emma. But Alan, it's tax evasion by an individual employee, not by the council. But apologies to you, you can't really know it's about a council employee through their office facilitating an individual with tax evasion through their professional knowledge through what they do. And it's about the body being held responsible for that. I don't. So, so uh, what you're saying is that if an employee aids someone, to evade tax, is that basically what you're saying? Yes, it is. Rather than they personally evade tax themselves? Yes, this is, a, this is about, and, and the list of examples, and to be fair to Emma and Ian, they had a list of a whole load of examples in the policy, and I said take them out because it's a policy document. And within things like that, it was about facilitating invoices coming in to either understate or overstate matters, and, and things like that that could then be used to facilitate tax evasion for that business. So that's a serious issue. I mean, we've got to turn over a quarter of a billion pounds a year. We could be guilty of things like that if we don't have the checks and balances in place. So it's making employees aware of the things that they should not be doing. And then through Andy's support and through my role, and your role as our staff, the officers, making sure we've got the checks and balances in place that don't allow such things to go ahead. Okay. I'm going to Councillor Olsen, uh, yeah. Councillor Olsen, Councillor Roberts has been waiting for a while, so I'll let her come in. Thank you, that's okay. Ms. Councillor Lecave waiting to come in as well. And, yeah, Councillor Lecave as well. You may have been waiting for older than me, I have to say. Are they? Right, Councillor Lecave, would you like to know? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Convener. I maybe want to um, remind Councillor Wilson of the legal concept of vicarious liability. Yeah, I think it's important in these type of areas that we do have policies and procedures to protect the, the, the council uh, uh, and its staff. So I do welcome the fact that 
or developing a policy in, in this particular area. Um, I'm not as lazy fair with uh, these particular matters. I, I, I was simply going to ask about, I suppose, the process we went through to develop policy. In some senses, I think Alan's partly uh, answered that. But I suppose, have we developed this off our own back, or have we sort of uh, got some sort of advice from, from somebody else or other councils or whoever's developed this? Uh, or is this something we, we could obviously share with other councils? Because I think it is important that um, councils councils do sort of share good practice among themselves as well. Yeah, through you, Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, the, we, uh, we got... Uh, some of this, one example, from another Scottish authority. We did some research as well for some authorities south of the border to see what others were doing. And, you know, we, we sort of took some bits from one and another and a bit of ourselves in it. So uh, through a combination, um, and I mean, as you say also, this is a sort of a start of a process, if you like. I think it's important we felt to have our policy position in place. But what we there's still quite a bit of work we need to do with service areas to get under the bonnet, if you like, and understand the particular risks that certain service areas may have compared to other service areas. And as, as Alan was referencing there, there are some sort of practical examples where we might think actually uh, some service areas um, need to have a bit more support around that. Um, so we used we used examples from elsewhere, if that's it. Thanks for the cave. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Thanks, but my question's actually been answered in a previous answer now. Thanks. Okay, that's good. Thanks. Councillor Robson. Thanks, Kira. Um, I, I did read a, for instance, so thank you for providing one, just so I could see how, under what circumstances, this policy would be applicable. I kind of just want to draw that a wee bit further, if that's okay, um, to the point of, of use. At what point and under what circumstances would a line be drawn to the council for this policy to, to kick in? I'm just not sure. So I can see if someone did an invoice uh, that under, understated tax for an, an external organisation, that happens as an incident, but how does the line then get drawn back? And by whom to actually make us have to take any action after that event has taken place, if you know what I mean? And through the company, I would imagine, I mean, in all my time here, there's never been an instance that we've known about of this going on, but we be picked up through investigations and audits of the organisation who would invoice us. If something came out, if there's an HMRC investigation or whatever, that would come back to us, or maybe through an audit of our own records as well, and Andy's already referred to the NFI type work that goes on. And so things like that might might flag it up as, as well. And through our own work as, as well may flag it up because you see on page 42, the list of the taxes includes things like non-domestic rates, includes things like council tax. So you can see the areas of the council. I mean, obviously my services come to centre with them, but legal services, procurement, regeneration, people are doing leases, these sorts of things. And you can see it getting into other parts of the council, employing people, self-employed, you know, will that be involved in tax evasion? So you've had all the IR35 cases which have been going on, you know, for the self-employed working for the council. All these things, mistakes will happen, but this isn't about mistakes. This is about arrangements being constructed in such a way to avoid tax. And that's why we need the relevant officers to be aware of this, to know what the con, how to raise these matters, and it's going to be through myself and Ian, or Craig given in terms of the HSCP, um, and to provide necessary support and training to the, the people with professional disciplines. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Policies coming in. I'm just wondering how this will impact the other policies and procedures within the organisation, and how we ensure that it's actually it's embedded within the and, and, and then if it's embedded, how to be then audited going forward? Is 
Um, yes, of course, uh, through you, Chair. Hold on, I might, if I might briefly, if it's okay, just in terms of Councillor Robertson's point, um, I mean, I can't think of an example where an authority has been found guilty of an offence under this, but I think this is probably also just another example of a move towards making large organisations more, um, I don't know, responsible for their actions or inactions, whether that be through matters such as this tax evasion, whether that be through damage to the environment, and just probably uh, symptomatic of that more general move. And as a large organisation ourselves, we also fall within that category. In terms, yeah, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, and I guess it recognises that, um, Councillor Curley, that we need to make government officers aware. We need to understand ourselves where... Uh, the greatest potential risk might be, uh, what tightening, if any, is then needed of relevant operational procedures in those areas. So that's what we need to take away and do that work uh, with relevant service areas. And the, on the back of that, there might very well be other policies that need updated uh, to pick up some things coming out of that as well. I would have thought that probably most of it would be more sort of operational procedures uh, than policies, but it might not be. Um, really reviewing policies anyway, and it is important, as I think you, you you know, that our policies do hang together as well. Um, so that's what we have to do. But you know, it's very important that staff training and awareness is a big part of this. Also, if that assists. Okay, yeah, thank you. Does that answer your question? Okay, uh, Councillor Wilson. Yeah, I'm struggling with this convener. We've done nothing for six years about this law. Two senior officers have both said they can't recollect any example of it having happened, an incident having happened. So I kind of think, well, what's the point of going ahead? What was useful, Alan, was when you said that in some of the original documentations there were examples of what could be offences underneath this. And I would quite like to see this coming back to the committee again with some more meat in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the, the proposal. And I'd like to propose that we bring it back to the next meeting with a bit more meat, specifically examples of uh, what might cause offence and might cause us to take action. No. More than happy to supply um, the background information to all the committee. My sense is, though, that this is a policy, and a policy shouldn't go down into the operational detail. Um, that could be part of the training, and maybe as part of the delivery of this policy, we can have a whole member briefing on the on the, which will include examples as well. Albeit the primary focus of this is about employees being made aware of the of the issues that are here. And I would back up what, what Ian has said in that this is something where it is very clear if something happens and we do not have this policy in place, the council will have no defence because it has done nothing. And so this is as much about managing the risk around the, the, the potential for this to happen. If we do nothing, then we've got no defence. It's about like health and safety and all these things. You hope nothing will ever happen that we will have to rely on, that you have checks and balances in place. Um, and, and hopefully the committee can support the policy, but more than happy to, to A, supply the, the examples that Emma drew up. Um, it's not a detailed how-to guide, so I don't want anybody, anybody sort of, uh, you know, sort of you know, taking advantage of any of the, the things that are in there, but what, what it does do, it, it gives you examples of the sorts of areas that the council, we, Ian and I need to focus on in groups of employees in the council to make sure that they're aware, that we're aware of these things. So we, you have members of, of the council, uh, councillors who are self-employed and have got businesses, um, does this drag them into this? No, I think no. Not. Oh, no. no, this is about council officials facilitating with third parties tax evasion by constructing deals, by 
processing payments, entering contracts, which, by the way, are then set up is about tax evasion. And, and that is the thing that this is this is meant to meant to cover up. So that's why we're looking at procurement, we're looking at finance, we're looking at legal, we're looking at regeneration. These are the services of the council, which potentially will enter into deals, and we've just got to be aligned to these factors and be aware of what our corporate responsibility is, and that's why we need a policy. It would have helped me, Alan, to see that sort of stuff in here. Mm -hmm. Well, do you convene a six point three and ties in with the question that Chris asked. It gives the ideas where the, the, the policies that the council has, it gives ideas of where the, the, the work is needed. So it covers IR55, it covers procurement, gifts and hospitality, these sorts of things. These are the, these are the areas that just knits all these things together into a single policy. So I think myself have concerns that suddenly Everyone who's dealing with people from outside is supposed to be a tax expert from the north, uh, you know, within the council. It, that's what it's sounding like, that they're also on a, a small training course and they're supposed to become a tax expert. You know, and how, how are they going to define, uh, you know, whether they think it's a problem and then how do they deal with it? Who do they take it to if they do, if they're not sure, you know? And obviously, they're going to be states made uh, because they're not tax experts as well. And through you, from being another, this we enter into scores of contracts arrangements every single year. And officers know through the financial regulations, through the standing orders for contracts, through the procurement policy, through all the other checks and balances we've got, through Andy's good officers that they are to consult with the relevant professionals when pulling these things together. So there's no individual, let's say, I'm going to use education or social work or roads, who's going to enter these things in a vacuum and be left, because they know through all these documents, which we have had for decades, the revised and the regulated, what have happened for decades, both as in the client council and as its predecessor authority, that they are to consult with legal services before issuing a contract. They are to consult with procurement before pulling together specifications. They are to consult with finance on tax matters. We've got the council's resident VAT expert who's been here for 20 years. Everyone knows who that person is. Now, if somebody chooses to ignore that and enter into another arrangement without going through those checks and balances, well, you can see the odds are that's going to end up being a disciplinary offence anyway, whether there's tax evasion involved or not. So I just want to reassure the members, we've got a lot of checks and balances in place. This is pulling something about the corporate liability and responsibility to make sure that we do our best to inform employees and to protect employees and protect the council. Hopefully that helps. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Plusky, would you like to invite me? Yeah, thank you. It's just, I, I don't personally see why this is controversial. You know, this isn't something that the council's coming forward with a policy in order to um, make it easier for us to comply with a piece of UK government legislation. As far as I see it, that's what UK government has passed this piece of legislation. I think to the point that was raised a moment ago, if we don't have a policy, it means as a council, whenever we if we ever face the circumstances that we are held liable, like we're basically asking officers to fly blind in terms of how they deal with it. So, I, you know, there's there's obviously um, there's obviously more that will sit behind this policy. You know, in terms of the detailed training resources and other things that will sit behind it. But I don't think it's particularly controversial to have a a policy that helps us deal with this if it ever does. That ever does come up and in terms of like the the the, the questions around you know ask the questions around people having to make um certain judgments it's you know this law exists so people will have to make those judgments at the moment anyway because this is the law um so i don't i, I, do, I just don't see what's controversial about having a policy to make it easier for people to navigate this thanks okay so any more questions from member now, I asked, if we come back again, did you suggest a briefing, Alan? I'm suggesting that 
two things can happen. Firstly, we can issue the addendum that we had with the examples in it, and then Ian and them are going to develop a training programme. If the audit committee believe that an all-member briefing on this, in line with what would be given to employees, would be useful, then we can do that. I would be happy with the addendum. That's really what I'm looking for. And, and this is informed the policy and resources, so, you know, that is looking point. forward to that. I think it's possible to include it in that whole yeah. 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 So, so we're not going to have a vote, are we? No. I was about waiting a bit. <laughs> yeah, try to have this. I mean, what it's saying here is, you know, we're approving this basically going forward to the policy and resources committee. So, uh, it can be discussed for yeah, I think we just beef it up a wee bit before it goes in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, members happy to approve this going forward to policy and resources. Is there somebody, uh, somebody else got a question? Stephen. Stephen. I'm, I'm saying, Nicola, I don't think we're being asked to approve it. I think we're being consulted on it. We're noting it, and it's going forward. Or to policy and resources because policy and resources makes policy in the, in, in the name. And, and I don't have any difficulty with the recommendation as it, it stands. And if members need the extra information and need a briefing, I'm perfectly happy with Okay, thank you, Sue. Right, so everybody happy with that? Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, it just, just summarise where we got to then. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's going to be a paper going forward to policy and resources, but Alan's going to add some more examples and things to yeah. it so that they know. Yeah. That's my understanding. So. Um, okay. Thank you, everyone. Then. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Good to see you back. Thank you.